Hi, I'm Rachel. And I'm Matt. Welcome to the Strange and Beautiful Book Club. Welcome back, friends. Welcome back. We actually haven't recorded in like a month. I know you've been listening to episodes, but we hustled and got all those done so you wouldn't miss anything. And then we went on a really long vacation. A a long American vacation. Yeah. I mean, for an American, it was practically scandalous. We were gone almost two weeks. How dare we? It was lovely. And there was much sailing and much sitting and much reading of things. I think collectively we read 11 books. (laughs) It's amazing what you can do when... When you just sit down. You just have chairs and drinks and uh, kids not around. Yeah, it is. Is this how the other half lives? No, because they also work. We weren't working. We were just sitting. Uh, But then we came back and we're back. And guess what month it is? Can you guess, Matthew? Matthew? Mm. It's our anniversary <laughs> month. Not Woo-hoo! like Matt and I's anniversary month. That's not this month. The podcast. It's the podcast's anniversary month. Uh, we started this podcast one year ago, I think November 16th, 2022. Yeah, I think uh, the first episode was published on the 18th. Yeah. So congratulations to us for making Woo-hoo! it one whole year. And we started with Nosferatu, so I came up with the, oh, like, really clever idea of doing vampire movies for our anniversary celebration. So we are going to do every vampire movie released in the year 1979, which may seem really random, except it is the year that no less than eight vampire movies all came out concurrently. And since just the wonderful audaciousness of that appealed to me, I thought... Well, yeah, we're going to do every single one of those, starting with Dracula 1979. It's not Dracula 1979, it's just Dracula. But of course, there's like 150 million Dracula movies, so you have to distinguish it by saying the number. So it's Dracula, made in 1979, starring Frank... Langella. Langella, thank you. As Count Dracula. As Count Dracula, who has a vaguely... Eastern European, mostly British accent. I'm fine with it. Oh, yeah. I'm cool. Dracula it's, can talk however Dracula it's wants. It's fine. I, I have to start with a confession. And I think I've said this before, but I don't know if I've explicitly explained it, but I don't like the Dracula story. As someone who loves vampires, probably pathologically, I absolutely hate the Dracula story. So luckily for us, this is not based on Dracula the book. This is based on Dracula the play, which is based on Dracula the book. (laughs) An adaptation of an adaptation. Yeah. And so I actually read a period review that was posted in the New York Times in 1979. And they call it a game of telephone. (laughs) I can see that Yeah, because by the time we get to this movie um, Mina is Van Helsing's daughter And uh, not the love interest And not the love interest, not the primary love interest She actually gets to be cannon fodder, which is what Lucy usually is And then Lucy is Lucy Seward, Jack Seward's daughter And Jack Seward is the one who runs the asylum and Jonathan Harker is in love with me, uh, with Lucy. So Lucy and Jonathan are together. He's not. He does not go to Transylvania and get captured or anything like that. He's just a solicitor. And Dracula comes to him. Dracula purchases the house via correspondence. Yes, correct. rather than summoning 
Harker to Transylvania. And this kind of felt like the new interview with the vampire in that I am happy with every single one of these changes. <laughs> um, Lucy is usually portrayed as the like feisty, fiery, independent character. And that's why she gets killed off first, because she's willing to be wild and free. And in this case, it's what saves her because it's what. That's what makes her attractive to Dracula. Dracula's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna get in on that. Oh, that's she got hot. some spirit. That's hot. I like I like a woman with some life in them, is what he says. Some <laughs> and blood. Blood. <laughs> um, I picked up this movie on a recommendation from one of the accounts that I follow on Instagram, and I just wanted to shout them out really quickly because I think it's something that a lot of people might be interested in following. And her name is queer for fear all one word queer for fear and she's actually writing a textbook and she does not put her pronouns in her bio but she has a very uh, female coded name and i haven't seen any thing to the contrary so i'm going to use she her so she is writing a textbook called queer for fear about the way uh the queer community interacts with horror And the unique way in which the queer community interacts with horror. And I think it's going to be, it's not out yet. It comes out in February. It's a legit textbook, like it's $70, but I don't know, I might get it just because it sounds like a really interesting exploration of the idea that so many of these characters are like queer characters. Like what is a vampire except someone who is forced to live a secret life because their actual nature is considered monstrous? And not that being queer is monstrous, but, but historically speaking, that's it how it's portrayed. It doesn't fit with mainstream society. Correct. And I just think that that is a really fascinating, really fascinating take on it. And she recommended this movie and said this is her favorite Dracula movie. And I was like, okay, fine. I'm going to try it out. Because I agree. it sounds amazing. It is really This is good. the best Dracula portrayal I've seen. It was really good. I'm surprised you liked it as much as you did. I have watched it three times since I rented it two days ago. So clearly I like it a lot. <laughs> um, there's actually two versions. There's the theatrical release, which was full color. And then there is the release that most people have probably seen because it's the one that they released when they released it for like home viewing. So when it came out on Laserdisc, uh, the director got the option of changing the color timing, which you, actually... You told me originally the director wanted the theatrical release to be black and white. Yes. And, and the studio was said like, mm, no. No, because he wanted it color. to be like the Bella Lugosi Hammer Horror black and white movies uh, because there's a lot of drama in black and white. And they were like, no. So he did it full color. And then when he had the option, he changed the color timing, which was does not make it black and white, but it does mute it significantly. And since then, actually, the rights have been obtained to release the full color theatrical release. So both are available. So I took the opportunity of watching both. And I have to say that the muted version, the one with the lower color timing, is ethereal and timeless and literally could have been made today. And the full color one feels very dated. It's got that like 70s haze. I don't know if that was just the way the cameras recorded things in the 70s or if the 70s were all like slightly out of focus. <laughs> but like, um, I feel like a lot of 70s it's movies. It's the lead in the atmosphere. It, it must have been. <laughs> I feel like a lot of 70s movies have that that atmosphere. And you don't notice it in the muted version, but in the color version, you do. I wonder if that's a consequence of the director wanting to, or like planning to release it in black and white. And so there was less consideration for color balancing while they were filming and like controlling that better. No, or, they would or have maybe had to it was film lit it. to be filmed in black and white. They would have had to film it in black and white at the time. I don't think they could have changed it. Not like today where we could run it through digitally and Yeah, I guess you'd have to you'd Yeah, have to, you have to plan like, ahead for that. <laughs> shine a light through the negative and re-record it. Yes. On new yeah. negatives. Okay. Um no, I think it's just that I have watched a lot of 70s movies and I think that's why 70s movies don't hold up as well as some like when you get to the 80s, they almost feel modern except for the clothes. 
And then in the 70s, for some reason, everything is just that little bit of, whoop, little bit off. Maybe the chemistry on the film. You know, it's probably like 30 years from now, people are going to be like, oh my God, the movies from the 2020s are so dark. They're so dated because they're so dark. Or it, I wonder if in like 30 years, the super high contrast screens will be like normal. Yeah. Like phone screens are OLEDs. Uh, like smartwatches or OLEDs. So the each pixel is a separate LED. And when you have a black pixel on a video, it actually turns the pixel all the way off. Yeah. So I've seen like the OLED TVs at stores and they have these demo videos playing and it's almost surreal how black they are yeah. when they're black. Because you forget what it's like to have a high contrast screen. Yes. Yeah. So one of, I think the, a lot of the like really dark movies that have been made recently were almost like planned to be watched on high end screens Mm, so that the high contrast is actually translated correctly onto the screen. But then a lot of people are watching these on LCD screens, which are always have a little bit of gray yeah. in the black. And so you don't get the same contrast. And maybe the really dark movies that we've been watching that have been made recently, not that we're really watching many <laughs> movies that have been made recently, um, but maybe in 20, 30 years, those movies will be like, oh man, this movie could be made today. Yeah. But then these other movies, but you wonder, uh, we don't, it's they're not dark enough. But you wonder if the conversation is going to go the way we talk about some of the television shows that we watch that are made to be watched on a CRT TV, and now that they're higher definition, you can see a lot of the stuff that they were a like, lot of the detail, a lot of the. Nah, and the it's makeup. not going to show up. It's yeah. fine. Yeah, I wonder if that's going to happen. Like, there's stuff hidden in the black that we're like, but we can't see it, and they're like, no one's going to see it. And then as soon as you get a higher contrast, it's going to be like, look, I can see the wires. Like, yeah, <laughs> I don't know, we'll find out. I can um, see the camera guy sit or the, the set guy <laughs> sitting, sitting in the dark shadow <laughs> that on my LCD screen looks, looks completely, completely black. black. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. But we open this movie with like shipwreck. And I do like so one of the like subtle changes that I really enjoyed in this movie is Dracula is not violent for violence sake. Almost any time he goes on a rampage and murders for something other than uh, a tasty snack is because someone is trying to harm him. So we open with there's a storm and they're trying to throw this crate overboard. And this crate is clearly labeled Count Dracula. Like, oh, really? Like it has the words Count Dracula? Yeah, on the side. And then it says something about Whitby because that's where they're headed. So it's supposed to be like, this is the property of Count Dracula, but surprise, it also is the contents. <laughs> it's just Dracula. <laughs> so they're trying to throw this crate over the side. And luckily, they didn't trim the side support properly. So it's sticking down like a half an inch and it catches on the side of the ship. And Dracula sticks an arm out and rips the guy's throat out. Well, because they're trying to throw him overboard. Because they're trying to throw him overboard. I mean, he's just defending himself. <laughs> he's, not, he's not being a bad guy. Well, then he turns into a wolf and kills the rest of the people. But, I mean, I don't know. They were all in on it. I don't know. I rooted for Dracula this entire movie. I don't know what to tell you. I was just like, yeah, it's just, I, this is fine. I'm fine with everything that he's doing. <laughs> um, and then the ship wrecks. It crashes against the rocks. And meanwhile, we see the asylum where... Uh, Dr. Jack Seward works, and this is played by Donald Pleasance, and he actually plays in, I think, all the Halloween movies. Interesting. He's he's Dr. Loomis or whatever. He's one of the characters, and I guess he was known, and I thought this was really interesting, as a handkerchief actor, and I saw him referred to multiple times as a handkerchief actor, and what it meant was he takes out handkerchiefs or he has a bag of candy, or he, he interacts, interacts with, with props. props. He yeah. does all of these really deliberate things so that if you cut out any part of his scene, it breaks continuity. So it forces them to keep his entire presence in each scene. 
And I thought that was really fascinating. Um, Working it, the system. It kind of got him a bad name because he was known as a scene stealer, I guess. But also just, I mean, he's working the system. He's working I mean, the program. That's a skill set. This is a, <laughs> I don't want to tell you. Um, I don't think he gets any excess screen time because of it. But it could just be in his defense of like, I'm Donald Pleasance and I'm here with young Frank Langella. I got to do what I can. Because <laughs> let me tell you, young Frank Langella uh, is one of the most attractive things about this movie. <laughs> let's, let's put it that way. And I know he's recently in like a small amount of hot water. And I'm not going to comment on it because I was reading up on it and there's a lot going on there and no formal anything has been like there's no formal charges or anything. He he was in a Netflix miniseries and what it sounds like to me is he hasn't kept up with the changing standards for how we interact with female co-stars. Specifically uh, touching. Yeah. And I don't want to say anything excusing anybody either way because I wasn't there and I don't know enough about it. So we're just not going to. We're going to leave it. We're just going to put it on the table. Just be aware that that happened. And if you want to read up on it, feel free to. However, in 1979, he's young and hot, and we're just going to go with that. And he'd actually been in Dracula the Play, and he won a Tony Award for Dracula the Play. Was and he Dracula in yes, Dracula? Yes, he was Dracula. And so he won a Tony Award for playing Dracula on the stage. Yeah. And, and then the they director, were like, let's make a movie The director that. went and saw him on stage, and he was like, I'm putting this man in a fucking movie and I'm making this into a fucking movie and they made it into a fucking movie with fucking, but not like graphic. This is the least graphic. In fact, it's, it's deliberately not graphic. Like Frank would not be in this movie if he had visible fangs or blood on his face. Those were his two stipulations. I will not have fangs and I will not have blood on my face. And he sticks to it. And I think it really heightens the, I am just another type of person with different needs from yours. And these cause me to do things that maybe feel questionable to you, but would feel normal to me. Um, and anyway, the shipwrecks. And I really like this part because Mina is watching the ship get wrecked because Mina it, is. Which I, I really like this change from the like or, original story where, or I guess the Nosferatu version. Yeah. Where. Dracula just kills everybody on the ship just yeah, you know, oh, for because snackies. <laughs> he got peckish for, for laughs. <laughs> yeah. um, and then the you know dead ship arrives at the harbor. Whereas in this case, he was defending himself. He killed everybody. Like maybe he lost his temper a little bit yeah. and killed everybody. So then the ship wrecks on the rocks. Yeah. But yeah, we get now we're at, on the beach. Right. And so Lucy is our strong character and we know that because she's reading a letter about how she got accepted into a law for law firm and she's reading it to mina and mina's like oh i so admire you being able to stand up with all these men and she's like mina we're not chattel but, but do you think it's really necessary <laughs> well we find out mina yeah. is um fragile and she's been sent to live with lucy to live at the seaside She's sickly. Take the sea air and have some laudanum, which was basically how we treated women for until 1999. So like here, have some drugs, go live by the seaside. You'll feel better. See you never. And so her dad has sent her her dad, Abraham Van Helsing, has sent her to live with Lucy and Jack. And I get the sense that Lucy and Mina have been friends. Yeah, they're like, for a long time. Yeah. And so Lucy goes to help in the asylum. Mina's supposed to be in bed, but she watches the ship wash up on the rocks. So she runs out to go see if she can help. And she ends up seeing a wolf run into a cave. I really like the transitions from Dracula to animals. Yeah. Except for one. <laughs> uh, particularly in this sequence. Yeah. The transitions of Dracula to wolf and wolf to Dracula. Well, I guess we don't see Dracula to wolf. We just see the wolf hop off. Yeah, the, the wolf ship. runs into the cave. During the storm, we see the hand reach out. I think we see the fingers come out and we cut away. And then when we cut back, the arm is farther out and it's all hairy. Yeah. And then the next time we see 
that it's uh, a, a full, fur coat, a, like a husky dog. Yeah. And then on the beach, we see the the wolf quote uh, mm-hmm. get off the ship and then run. And then we have this close up on some fur on a rock, and a human hand just slides out. Yeah. And then when we zoom out, it's Dracula in a coat with fur cuffs. cuffs. Yeah. 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 And I thought that was a really, like, really clever transition to imply that, oh, we're looking at a close up of the wolf fur. Here comes a human hand, and we're not going to try to do any, like, makeup or anything to imply that he's changing back into a human. Just the hand slides out, and then Mina grabs his hand. Right. Oh, yeah. The Mina grabbing his hand scene, because his hand comes out and just rests on this rock. And so she puts her hand on his, and so he pulls two fingers out, and he ends up, like, grabbing her hand and pulling it in. Like... I mean, forget the Pride and Prejudice hand flex scene. This is my new favorite hand scene. The like where he holds her hand because he's he's hurt. He just was right. in he, a shipwreck. He is legitimately like re- recovering right. from this shipwreck. Right. And she gives him a moment of comfort after this. He was someone tried to kill him. He had to defend himself. He washed up on the shore and passed out. And because, uh, Mina shows up. Yeah. And then like, hey, you're not alone. I'm yeah. holding your hand. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> I fucking love this movie. And so then we cut to... He just wants a hug. He just wants a hug. I mean, come on. And a little bit of blood. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. And so we end up on the shore. And um, actually, the guy who plays Jonathan Harker, Trevor Eve, he also plays in Discovery of Witches. He's Jaber, like the evil Venetian vampire. I just thought that was really interesting because I didn't recognize him. And then I looked it up and they're using the picture of him from Discovery of Witches. And I was like, no. And then I went back and watched it. And I was like, oh, my God, it is him. But he's driving a car. He drives this car around all the time. It's a really cool car. But you can see he's driving on plywood covered in sand. Did you notice that? No. Because he's driving over the beach. It makes sense that... uh... They'd have to do something because yeah. there's one part where <laughs> the, he rolls over narrow tires. There's one part where he rolls over a seam and you can see the plywood flip up for a second. It took me three watches to catch it. So if you didn't, that's fine. <laughs> but this is kind of like, OK, here's Jonathan Harker. He's a solicitor. We brief, briefly meet Milo Renfield, who is our Renfield, obviously. And we get like a throwaway line that implies Renfield owned the Abbey. And Carfax that Abbey. Carfax Abbey and that Jonathan Harker sold it out from underneath of him and that he really didn't think it was worth whatever he sold it to Dracula for. Well, another thing that I really enjoyed about this movie is we do not frame Jonathan Harker, Jack Seward or Abraham Van Helsing as like heroic characters. Right. They're almost bystanders that are just trying yeah, to survive. They're like frat bros that don't like <laughs> That Dracula is uh, comes in and immediately attracts all the women. Because we go through this whole thing where they're like, yeah, they're just boxes full of dirt. There's another one and another one. There's just a bunch of them. And Milo's like, I'll take them up. Renfield's like, I'll take them up to Carfax Abbey. And the one guy's like, no, you can't. Dracula has to come and claim them. And Jack pulls his like lawyer dick out. He's like, no, no, yeah. the guy's dead, which means the ship owner has already surrendered his rights. We can just take them up. It's fine. And this is really just to... Introduce the characters and give Jack Seward a chance to say, Renfield, when you see Dracula, can you tell him we want him to come over tonight? Like when he right, run, when it, he gets up. It's implied that Renfield is still living at Carfax Abbey, even though Dracula bought it from him. Yeah. And they have some kind of cooperation going on. It could be less of like he sold it to him and more of he is a servant who has been attached to the property. Oh, just he's like the caretaker. He's for like this the caretaker, property. and he's okay. been living there, and so they sold it, and now somebody's going to live there. But he's been able to just live there and coast and not take care of it because no one's owned it for so long, and the property itself could have some kind of uh, like a stipend that it gets that he uses yeah. to live off of. It's possible. Um, this is it's supposed to be set in nineteen thirteen. We don't really clear it up, and it doesn't really matter for the plot, so, like, whatever. And from here, we end up going to 
like the Abbey slash house of the Seawards. And this is when we find out that Lucy and Jonathan are together because they roll up and she and Jonathan just start making out. She's like, Jonathan. And then she goes in for a kiss well, and it turns into like, uh, like a, <laughs> a full on like make out session. Yeah. And uh, Jack is like, Ugh, save it for marriage. Yeah. <laughs> and he's actually holding a bag of sweets. Did you see that? He's he's eating some kind of candy the whole movie. I wonder if that's why Brad Pitt's always eating. Oh, like a a handkerchief actor? Yeah. That's very possible. Hmm. That's something to think about. So she's like, oh, no, I don't look great. I was up all night. How's Count Dracula? Because Mina found Count Dracula. They all rescued him. They took him to so Carfax they're, Abbey. They're invested. Yeah, they're like, oh, I hope he's doing all right. We took him to Carfax Abbey. He's resting. Hopefully he's recovered. He's coming over for dinner tonight. Instant sympathy points. Yeah. And then we immediately go to dinner, like forget everything in the middle because the dinner scene is like the best scene ever because they're all just hanging out. And Jonathan's like, you can't tell me that like that guy slipped on the tiller and it ripped his throat out. And that's why he was tied to like, what? No, this is ridiculous. And Lucy's like, can we not talk about how these people died right before dinner? And he's like, oh, fucking fine. And this is why I think all the dudes are supposed to be, I don't know if they're supposed to be, but they are unlikable because the only time he really interacts with Lucy is when he's about to get something that he wants from Lucy. And every other time she's immediately dismissed. And we've set her up as this independent female character. It's 1913. Women are about to break free in a lot of ways. And so I think Lucy is supposed to be one of those like forward thinking women in 1913. And Jonathan's not treating her that way. Even when they're dancing, it's a very stilted. Oh, yeah. Dance. Yeah. And the only time they really like have a like romantic emotional moment is when they just like kiss. They go kiss and then they continue dancing. And then the guy walks in and he's like, uh, may I present Count Dracula? And we get our first count dracula scene where he walks in and at first he has the full like dracula regalia he With has the, the cape and everything the cape and the collar and the whatever and as he walks in he just unlatches the cape and just holds it out behind him like <laughs> he just kind of tosses it at the guy yeah the doorman swales and swales grabs it and he just marches into the room and i love the way he plays dracula because i get tired of the dracula is so socially like pretty Elegant looking, but just socially incapable of interacting with anyone. He's just right. like, oh, yes, I sit over here. But this guy, Frank, Lang Frank Langella, plays him like a suave Eastern European man who is. And one of the things that I really enjoyed is every time he's talking to a character, his focus is entirely on that character. So when he's talking at first, he walks in and he sees Lucy and he walks over and he's like, well, hello. <laughs> she's like, what have we here she's like oh hi count and then he sees mina and so he walks over and he's like oh mina my savior thank you so much for finding me today and he has all these really yes, he's fun... the, the charismatic mediterranean man oh yeah oh it's yeah uh, it's nice it, and his focus he immediately greets both women he does not greet the men until after he's greeted Lucy and Mina. Right. And then he's like, oh, hello, Dr. Seward. And he's like, ah, Jonathan Harker. Yes, my solicitor from overseas that I've been writing many, many letters with. And he's like, okay, can we go record the deed so I can officially own Carfax Abbey? And they're like, no, come on, we're going to dance tonight. Well, John's like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. And Lucy's like, uh-uh, no. No, it's not this business. This is a special night. Yeah. We're here to celebrate, you know, that you survived the shipwreck, I guess. So she puts music on. She's like, come on, Count, let's dance. And he goes, I hardly know. And she goes, no, it's fine. I'll teach you. And when he walks over, he goes, no, I mean, I hardly know you. you. Oh, his voice is amazing. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I would listen to him read the phone book. That is... <laughs> that The way he softens his voice in that moment of just like, no, I meant I didn't know you. And she goes, nonsense. And then they have this really charismatic dancing scene where she's clearly having a lot of fun. And Jonathan Harker is clearly not digging it He's at all. He's getting so jealous. So jelly. And then we get them sitting at dinner and we get the line, the, the line, you know, uh, I don't drink wine. 
And the 1979 review that I read was like, he didn't give enough of a pause. He's supposed to say, I don't drink wine. But he just says, I don't drink wine. He doesn't really get, and I like that because. Well, it was, he, he it feels like he, he rushes to add wine. He's like, I don't drink wine. Yeah. Rather than like, I don't drink wine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like he's there's... not he's not emphasizing yeah. it. He's just sticking it on the end. There's these iconic lines that you're looking for in a Dracula adaptation, which is one of the reasons I don't really enjoy Dracula is because it becomes formulaic. Right. It's and too much tropey. What other horror monster has this canonical story that we just can't let go of? Probably 16 adaptations of Dracula will come out in book form this year if you poke around far enough. it We just can't let go of it. We're just like stuck on Dracula. And it's, I guess it's because it's the archetypal story of like the, Yeah, it's like the first one. And yeah. so people are like, okay, I'm let's get rid of all of the the weird stuff people have been doing dra- with Dracula. Let's go back to the source material and do a fresh adaptation. Again and again and again and again. And... I mean, okay. We had one. We had the the last voyage of the Demeter came out this year in theaters. Yeah, which is the ship that he takes. Right, the ship that crashes. Uh, I mean, okay. It was fine. It's fine. It's fine. If you like them, you know what? I'm not. It's fine. If you want to enjoy them, they're generally not for me because I like best when vampires interact with people and they have to mask because I find that the most interesting. And I like this one because he is masking, but only as much as he wants to. Because Mina starts to talk and she gets a headache. She gets like a immediate yeah, headache. I would say like conversationally, he's he's kept up the skills. Oh, yeah. It's but really culturally, nice. he doesn't give a shit. Right. Yes. Because like when we're at dinner, okay, we'll get back to the Mina headache. But when we're at dinner, he's having like a legit pleasant charismatic conversation An engaging conversation yeah cuz they say something about the ship log and he's like oh it was not lost at sea and they're like no it wasn't lost at sea and he the last entry was just this word and mina thinks it means like dead or not dead or uh, undead and mina goes yes nosferatu and he goes ah yes was it yes, mina not or dead. lucy cuz they mentioned later that lucy knows some romanian right but no it's mina okay. because mina knows bunch of whatever okay. mina's the one because she immediately goes yes nosferatu and he goes ah not dead and then he's getting ready to explain the nuance between like how nosferatu isn't one-to-one because all translation is a betrayal <laughs> <laughs> he's getting ready to explain it and swales cuts his finger and he like stops for a minute and he looks over it and it's he like gets distracted it's like hold it together hold it together hold it together and he ends up like uh, Mina breaks the tension. She's like, oh, whatever. It's all scary to me. And I, I don't like talking about it. And that's when Lucy's like, I like being scared. And he goes, oh, do you? Like, oh, huh, yeah. And this brings me to another point that I thought I, I wanted to bring up, which is uh, Frank Langella has an eye condition. I think it's called nystagmus. And it's where your eyes move constantly. You don't, they're involuntarily like flicking all the time. And there's another famous actor uh, he used to be in a bunch of small parts. I mean, he may have passed away, but um, his was more severe where they moved like side to side all right. the time. His um, Frank Langella's is a little bit more subtle. I think this really, really, really adds to the otherworldliness of his character because when he does that thing where he stops and looks over at the finger and his eyes are just doing the like subtle back well, and, and forth. And they, they always have a light near the camera. So everybody's eyes have like this bright spot in them yeah. that's really pronounced. So the the eye movement it makes his eyes glitter. is very visible. Yeah, yeah, it, it glitters. Yeah, and that just adds to his like his charm, his charisma. Yeah, when he's especially his when other he's worldliness. Like, yeah, you mentioned when he's interacting with somebody. Yeah. He has, they have their, his full attention. Yeah. And so he's like looking them, making eye contact with them. And you can just see while he's looking at them full on, his, you know, eye is like glittering. Yeah. At, which just, you know, accentuates his. 
I thought it worked Charisma, really well. Yeah. I thought it was really cool. And I guess there was a concern that it would undermine his um, menace. But that's not the I point I think it makes, makes it look like he's always got something else going on in his head. Right. Or like he's trying to focus solely on you, but his it's un, it's hard for a predator to be completely focused and like he's trying to also be aware of everything around him. It just works really well, especially in the scene, the dinner scene when he looks over and his eyes are like, it makes him look like really tense. Like he's trying to look away, but he can't. Right. Yeah. And then we get to the part where Mina gets the headache. And this is, it's vaguely implied that he may have done this because she's talking to him and he like puts his oh, hand yeah. up by his head and he's got his two fingers, which are like his power fingers. <laughs> he's got them like yeah. up leaning on his head. And all of a sudden she's like, oh, my head, it hurts. And they're like, oh, quick, get some laudanum. We'll give her some laudanum. And he's like, no, you must not pollute her blood. <laughs> A little slip of the tongue. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I always... Um, he's like, no, you must not pollute her blood. And they're like, what? And he's like, I'm from an old country. A simpler people. And we're a simple people. Uh, I'm just going to hypnotize this away. And this that's when Jonathan Harker's like, oh, I think she'd rather have a headache. And Lucy goes, why? And he goes, I think Mr. Harker believes there will be some gross waving of arms, but that is not my method. And then he's just like, whoop. <laughs> Okay, you don't have a headache anymore. When look was, at me. Look at me. See me. And then he steps back and he's like, oh, well, he says, when you wake up, you will remember nothing. And then he steps back and he does like a hand flick. Like He, a, uses, he uh, twitches his power fingers again. Yeah, and she wakes up and she's like, oh, is this something I said? Ugh. I want to take a moment and address the dialogue too. All of his dialogue is so lovely. And like borderline, I'm telling you my secret, but I'm not telling you my secret because we get don't pollute her blood. I'm going to need it later. <laughs> we get. Yes. There's a lot of just foreshadowing. Yeah. Where he's like you said, he's masking. Yeah. But only just enough. Only just enough. Only as much as he feels like he really needs to convince what are effectively his prey. Right. And like he knows that. People, humans, he's been around for a while, will just assume the implications that are kind of most expected. Yeah. People hear what they want to hear. Right. So when he makes a little slip like, don't pollute her blood, they interpret it as, oh, he like. Maybe it's a translation error. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And then, like, when he's getting ready to explain Nosferatu, he's getting ready to explain himself, like, the subtle difference between undead, not dead, dead, you know, that there's this liminal space in between, I ought to know, that's where I live. But he gets interrupted. And then earlier, he talks about Carfax Abbey, and he's talking, telling Jonathan, thank you so much for finding me this really fucking fantastic house. And Lucy laughs, and she says, I can't imagine that anyone besides Milo Renfield could spend more than a day there. And he says, it takes more than a day to make a house a home. And then he says, besides, and I'm so, in this for the long he goes, haul. so few days go to make up a century. And she goes, what? And he goes, I am of an old family. I cannot live in new houses. <laughs> wow. Well, we mean... Of course, you can just be like, ha ha, this is a shallow horror movie. Or you can be like, I am not capable of the kind of change required to become a completely modern man. Like, I cannot live in new houses. I am who I am. Right. I can be an inter I can be an engaging conversationalist, but I'm I'm not going to be able to like live in a city and yeah live my life the same way that everybody else does. Right. Going yeah. to the coffee shops and going to buy my food and whatever. Yeah. That's all. That's not, you know, mm. approachable for me. I need to go live yeah. on a cliffside <laughs> in this gigantic <laughs> building. We will get to Carfax Abbey. We're not there yet. But we <laughs> so actually we have been to Carfax Abbey because that's where he wakes up. Because Milo Renfield is bringing crates in. Yeah, we've been on the inside of it. Yeah, and this is probably the transition you were talking about when you said there's one animal transition <laughs> that you don't like. Because Renfield's bringing these crates in. 
And he wakes up and we haven't actually seen him yet. We've only seen his hand and we see his hand again where he uses it to open his crate. And then he's he comes out the door and Renfield looks up and he's like, this is the last crate. And you're lucky, too, because I'm not a machine. And he doesn't say anything. He just like we hear spreads a, out his cloak a bat noise quote unquote i don't know what this i've never heard a bat make this sound before but we hear this bat noise and he like spreads his cloak and it looks like bat wings and then poof, he's a bat and we see like well he like jumps and he's on a wire with his cloak fully extended and billowing yeah and he glides a little bit like that and then we cut to like the bat, the bat point POV of view cam. camera. Do you remember that movie? Was it Hardcore Henry? Where it was an entirely POV movie. It was yes. like a first person shooter video game, but it was a movie. And we only saw the main character's hands the entire yes. movie. I want an entire movie that's just bat POV. It's just ee! <laughs> flying around as the bat. Because he like subdues Renfield as the bat. He's like, oh no. And he falls over and the bat's like, like he's but I want to know. Okay, so Dracula bought this house. He bought this Sight house. Unseen. He did not build this house. Who, Who built the fuck this house? Built this house. Who built this house? There. Okay. The this is called Carfax Abbey. Yes. Implying this used to be a monastery. Correct. Like a church building that people lived in. Yeah. And that's where all this design aesthetic came from. The design aesthetic. Like the monster head hand like rails on the side of the staircase, which are like giant stone monstrosities that like mutate into the wall that goes up the side of the staircase. The giant, the giant like the, embossed face the carving door mouth around the, the entranceway. The bat pillars. The intertwined snake lamp, like lamp holders, uh, the tormented soul carvings in the wall. Where it it's is like totally <laughs> fitting and believable that this is Dracula's home. Yes. Except he didn't it's been here it for a long time unless and his, he just moved here. Maybe, maybe his presence warps reality around him. And so anytime it's like in Good Omens where all of the tapes in Crowley's car oh, turn, turn into, into Queen. Queen's greatest yeah. hits. Maybe anywhere that he lives will eventually be this gothic monstrosity. I have no notes. I would live here. It's fucking fantastic. I was already trying to figure out how we could make our our mid-century ranch into this. I was like, can I have a doormouth? Can I do that? The fact that this movie was described as romantic gothic horror, like, fine, stop. I already came. We're done. Like, this is great. I'm already watching this. Let's do this. And then we have this romantic gothic horror mansion. Fine. But it also kind of makes no sense. <laughs> it makes no sense why this building looks like this in this place. And yeah. it's called an abbey. Unless there was some, like, psychedelic death cult monks <laughs> that built this place. <laughs> they were like, can I sell this to a guy? Ah, he's Romanian. It's fine. He'll love it. And so he, he buys it. Oh, it's fine. I love the part where he cleans. He clearly cleans, adds new candles, gets everything shiny. It's but, like everything but 15 But leaves feet, all the cobwebs. It's like ground up to 15 feet, and then everything above that is still all the cobwebs. Which he could have just flown through them as a bat, collected them, like changed, ripped the bat, ripped the cobwebs off, flown through them again. <laughs> Maybe they're his friends. I don't know. But this is an excellent time to get to. We'll just fast forward to the part where Lucy gets out of bed to go meet Jonathan Harker in the middle of the night to have an a li illicit liaison. And leaves Mina by herself, which Dracula's like, oh, yeah. Right. You know the meme? She, she hears something because I, I assume he she makes a noise. She hears the clock noise. chiming. She, oh, I think they had the like clock. a predetermined time oh, to get they, together. They had a date. They had a date. So he goes down. He jumps out, which is like the only jump scare in the whole movie. And she's like, oh, fuck you, Jonathan. And he's like, yeah, fuck me. <laughs> and she's he's like, like all I, right. I thought you liked being frightened. And yeah. she's like, oh. Don't be so modern. She goes, oh, you're so, you pretend to be modern, which is the 1979 equivalent of saying like, oh, you pretend you like independent women, but you actually don't. You just say that, which Dracula actually said and then backs up because Lucy calls him out for hypnotizing Mina with his eyes. 
And she's like, oh, okay, great. Now she's not even going to have her own independent will. And he's like, that's exactly the kind of hot take that I came to London to get. So thank you so much, Lucy. And Jonathan's like, yeah, right. And he goes, no, seriously, I like my women full of life. All right, but let's just get to what I really want to get to here, which is Lucy runs out to meet up with Jack. And John. John, sorry. Normally Jack. John. And we get kind of a, woohoo, they're going to have a moment thing. And then we cut back to Mina, and Mina's like, what's that? Because Dracula did, you know the meme where the guy's behind the tree, and he like rubs his hands together? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Because he saw, hey, Mina's alone. So he... Uh, climbs down the wall. It's really cool. This whole effect is really yeah, cool. It's a nice effect of yeah. him climbing the wall because he, he's climbing from the top down. Yeah. But his cape is still like hanging towards his feet. Yeah. So it's like he's, it, it, it feels supernatural. Correct. And I think it works really well in the muted version, in the full color version. This just looks ridiculous. <laughs> But in the muted version, this is very uh, ethereal and otherworldly and kind of creepy. But can you imagine if you had superpowers and every time you used them, you generated mist? A thick fog surrounds you. God damn it. (laughs) You're just trying to be subtle, climb up a wall, and all of a sudden, like, the fog rises and the sun gets covered. And you're like, no, I just want to climb up the wall. So he climbs down the wall and then you see. He's trying to show uh, Lucy a trick in bed. Yeah. He's like, let me. Let me show you this special thing. Uh, And then it's like. (laughs) God damn it. (laughs) Fog rolls out from under the bed. Dang it. (laughs) Get the dehumidifier. (laughs) You have like six in the bedroom. (laughs) Anyway, back to the seriousness of this moment. Uh, We see like the mist cover the window. And then you see like the hand like come out from beside the window frame right and he's trying to use his power fingers to open well, he's the just knob trying to open the knob it won't open well i don't think it has a knob on the outside he's trying uh, to use his like telekinesis to, but it's locked but it like he can't pull it hard enough i don't know it's locked so, because i don't know he ends up picking the, the glazing caulking, off yeah out, picking the glazing off and removing the whole glitch this at first i was like what is he's like what is he doing? But then you see he's like pulling the glazing out with his fingertips. And then he like leans out to look at Mina and he's still completely upside down. And he has this just like intense expression on his face. And Mina's like, no. But then as soon as he finishes and he pulls the glass out, which we never reference again, and he opens the window. He puts it back when he leaves. It, it breaks. We actually have a little <laughs> caption glass breaking. Um, he opens the door and then he's walking in because... Right. He's, uh, this is like the second or third floor. Yeah. But he walks. He walks in. Into the window. And Mina's like, like there's oh, a balcony. Oh, thank God it's you. I didn't recognize you upside down. Let me unbutton the top button of my nightdress <laughs> to make this easier. I mean, this plays to the very 70s aspect of Dracula, which is Dracula represents to like the women he preys on uh, liberation, empowerment. The ability to be stronger. Not and, just personally, but also sexually. Yeah. Yeah. Personally, sexually, politically. Like, he's giving them this moment, the opportunity to be the aggressive party, to flip the script for themselves. And I think that that plays really well in this 70s Dracula, because we said it in 1913, where women are really starting to feel the burden of... Uh, the previous century's captivity. Suffrage. Yeah. And, I mean, of course, we're still fighting the good fight, but this is, you know, the the baby feminist movement in 1913. And here's this guy who's like, I am completely attracted to you. I am devoted to you. I'm asking you to change nothing. And I'm willing to give you power equal to my own. Right. And I'm not asking you to do things for me. Yeah. I'm asking you to do things with me. Yeah. And hello. And Mina's like, sold. Okay. And so she uh, prepares herself, (laughs) makes herself ready. And he like, we see him creep up on her. And then we cut to a wolf howling, which the 1979 version was like, why does the wolf, the 1979 critic was like, why does the wolf howl every time this man gets laid? (laughs) 
<laughs> he is the wolf. He is the wolf. I don't know. So he, we hear a wolf howling, and Lucy's like, what is that? And Jonathan's like, but it's just a dog. Don't pay attention. Go back to kissing me. And so they go back to kissing. And then we cut to the next. A comment about the whole wolf thing. Mm. I I recently saw some pictures. It was probably an Instagram reel. But they were explaining that, hey, you, you think that wolves and dogs are like still, you know, we know they're related. Dogs are descended from wolves. And you think, oh, yeah, yeah, a wolf is just you know, a dog that's a little more feral, whatever. Uh, but no, there's a huge size difference. So a, like, a gray wolf is about twice the size of a large dog. Yeah, they're fucking huge. They're humongous. Yeah. And we don't actually use wolves for obvious reasons. Um, we use... Like, Wolf-like dogs. The most adventurous movies will use like a half, the half wolf, half wild wolf, half dog. Yeah. Uh, so that it's bigger, but it's harder to train. And so the wolf that we see, the quote wolf that we see in the movie here, is a dog. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if Dracula is like the runt of his family. <laughs> In dog form? No, he's the king of his kind, and he says that multiple times. So, no, don't... It, don't maybe mm -mm. maybe he can control his size, because we see two different size bats. Right. We went... Our, we watched Nosferatu first. That was our very first movie that we watched. And remember, the werewolf was actually a hyena? Oh, yes. I yes. do remember that. So, the fact that we at least have the right type of animal... Let's just celebrate the little things, okay? It doesn't. It's fine. Extrapolate this out. He's it, a giant. It matches. Gray wolf. Maybe his transformation matches to the regionally appropriate canine. Yeah, this is his fun size form. Yeah, <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Uh, but we wake up the next morning, and Lucy's like, "Well, you know, Lucy crawls back into bed with Mina, right?" And Mina's and asleep. Mina's like, "Yeah, out." Yeah, comatose. Yeah, she's post-coital, like <laughs> just sleeping. And when Lucy wakes up, Mina is like choking. She can't yeah. breathe, and she's like, "Take a breath." But then she calls her dad, and uh, poor Mina is like, "No, my throat. It hurts really bad." And she ends up dying, which is really sad and, and traumatic for Lucy. Yeah, especially since she calls her dad in to help, and her dad like chokes her and slaps her, and is like, "Take a breath." Yeah. It's a good thing a doctor's here. Let me grab your head and slam it into the pillow, and then I'm going to slap your face a few times. That's medical treatment for women. In um, fun the early fact: 1900s. that is still medical treatment for women. <laughs> this is as advanced as science gets. Okay, honey. <laughs> and quick, get the drugs. The only thing that stops this from happening is now a nurse has to be in the room with you if it's a male doctor. Mm. Although Lucy's right there and he's just like, yeah, I'm going to slap this. It's fine. What do you mean the laudanum in the seaside didn't fix her? Well, hot damn. Because she stops breathing and they're like, that's it. She's dead. That's it. She's done. We, I don't even We've think... tried nothing and we're all about <laughs> we're all all of ideas. ideas. <laughs> and then they tilt her head to the side. Can we please? I just. Can someone, I don't know, bite an apple? What does that look like? Okay. Can we have Frank Langella bite an apple? Bite a carrot? Put. Put, bite, some, bite a substrate. put some ink on your sharp teeth and just gently, like, mouth somebody's neck. And, oh, that's where the teeth marks would be. <laughs> Canines are not a half inch apart, and they're in the wrong direction. Why is this so hard? <laughs> to, get, to get teeth marks in this location, his forehead would be on her cheek, <laughs> his chin would be on her shoulder, like parallel with her neck and yeah. the fangs would have to be pointing straight out of his face i i want to just become a, a makeup artist and my only just job to fix this is fang make is fang like teeth marks bite marks that's it is all i do that would be my specialty like okay let's think through what angle was his head how far apart are actual canines uh, i don't know why it bothers me so much but i just can't get over it and they're like oh what is what does he say he goes oh those are not wholesome. And Lucy goes, not wholesome? What the fuck? And then she just I think crying. he's implying it's like a well, hickey. Well, those aren't great. He's like, well, that's not, that's not great. 
And then they're just eating breakfast and he's trying to send a telegraph. And this is another instance where I don't think we're supposed to see the human men as heroic because he's trying to send a telegraph, but he's eating while he's sending a telegraph. And he's just yelling at the telegraph lady. He's like, no, Mina has died, died, not not lied, lied, died. And poor Lucy is like, can we have a modicum of respect for this woman who just died in your house? Possibly because you slammed her head into the pillow when she was choking. (laughs) And she's talking to her dad and she's like, what do you think? Like, what killed her? And he goes, killed her. Hmm, That's an interesting way of looking at it. Right. Oh, my gosh. Do we think she just didn't die of female death? (laughs) Don't don't women just was she on her period? When was the last time she had her menstrual cycle? Could she possibly have been pregnant? Like, there was just no, no, not. He's just like, I don't know. I don't think she was killed. He was like, "Okay." well, she goes, well, what about the marks on her neck? And he goes, oh, maybe she like cut herself when she was pinning her shawl and she's like dad seriously cause of death vagina (laughs) (laughs) possessed of vulva end of life um yeah and jonathan harker's like well you should eat you should keep up your strength and she's like would somebody mourn this woman please which is probably why she's immediately attracted to dracula after this because dracula is at least like I'm really sorry that that happened. Right. He at least acknowledges, like, I I notice that you seem to be taking this pretty hard. Yeah. And I acknowledge that. I acknowledge that. I, I see your pain. Yes. I, I have felt the same pain before. And she's like, a fucking thank you. Thank you. That's all I want. And I honestly think, from Dracula's point of view, in this particular movie, he was trying to help Mina. Because Mina was sickly. Mina saved his life. He was trying to give her what he has. He's empowering her. He was, I think, from his perspective in this movie, yes. Does he then immediately be like, well, that didn't work. Could you make an allegory that an empowered woman becomes a monster to mainstream, to the patriarchy? I think you very much could. And I think that's a lot of horror, um, hammer horror women. Yeah. Well, yes, we haven't talked about the lady with the baby in the asylum. And probably literally the only reason this woman is in this asylum is because she's a single mom. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And so she is confined to an institution because something that was likely beyond her control happened to her. And And she was not able to provide for her child. Yeah. Well, no, if you were a single mom, you just didn't get to be in society. You got removed from society until the child could be sent off and you could pretend you didn't have it. Yeah. So if you wanted to keep the baby, you went to an institution. You you went to live with family in obscurity. In the seaside. On the seaside. Yeah. And if you didn't have family that could take you in, you went to an institution like this, a workhouse or like a asylum or whatever. I don't know. I'm not sure what the point of the baby, why she breaks in to kill specifically the baby. I don't know, except that, uh, hmm. I don't know, because this gets into the idea of like motherhood is a form of subjugation because often, especially in this time period, women were expected to give up their lives, especially lower class women. In order to take care of their children because your highest moral good in life was to be a mother. Right. Women are baby factories. Yeah. Women are their only value is their ability to reproduce. And so once you can no longer do that, you lack value. You are meaningless. You might as well just die of of owning a vagina. Like that's it. You're done. And when she when Mina dies, ultimately. Um, that form of reproduction is taken away from her. And so, yes, that's monstrous. She is something other than what society wants her to be. She is an empowered woman who cannot make babies. So she also is a bit of, she's more monstrous than Lucy becomes. Right. And this is the part of the Dracula myth, which to me has always been like, hmm, because he always kills one of them first. Usually it's Lucy. And Lucy is just the cautionary tale. Like, oh, no, if he drinks from somebody for enough times, then they become this monster. We don't want that for Mina. Let's save Mina like we couldn't save Lucy. And in this one, it's not framed quite the same because Mina was already frail. 
I do think he thought that that was going to work out, but then she ultimately is sicker than he thought she was. Because he says, like, I'm sorry that that happened to her. I didn't realize she was so frail. And this is when Jonathan shows up at his house. Jonathan shows up at Carfax Abbey, and he knocks on mm-hmm. the door and nobody opens. So he goes through the side door and he lets himself yeah, in. Yeah, he has the key. Yeah, and he ends up walking into the... He walks into the main room and he's like, Count Dracula! <laughs> Dracula and pops bloop. up. <laughs> like he was sitting down behind there. He pops up and he's like, you don't need to shout. You scared me. <laughs> and he's like, oh, I'm sorry. There was nobody here to let me in. And he's like, oh, where is Renfield? And the guy's... Uh, J- Jonathan's like, I don't know. I don't know where Renfield is. And he's like, God, that guy's so fucking useless. But it doesn't matter. You're here now. Come on up. We'll sign some papers. And so he's wearing his, like, thinking robe. His... Very fancy lounging attire. And so he pulls him, he brings him up and he blows out the candle, which is the only source of light. So I'm not sure why he blows out the candle, but he blows out the candle. And then they end up having like a moment where they're having a a civil conversation. And he's like, Oh, sorry to hear about Mina and Miss Van Helsing. And Jonathan's like, Wow, you already heard? And he goes, Yes, news of death travels fast. And then they have this okay, you're going to go and, you know, I'm going to sign this deed and you're going to go to London immediately and have it recorded, right? And he's like, no, Mina's funeral is tomorrow. I got to stay for that. And he's like, yes, yes, of course. He keeps getting to this, like, he's pushing people and then he realizes he's pushing too hard. And so then he has a line where he pivots a little bit. Sometimes, sometimes he doesn't mind and he just goes forward. Like he he gives him that letter and he's like, Can you please give this to Mr. Seward and tell him that he and Lucy are invited to my home for my hospitality? What's he gonna cook? His his kitchen is full of rats. <laughs> and then he follows it up with I'm, You are also welcome, of course, but I understand won't you won't be here. Yeah, but you won't right? be here, right? And Jonathan's like, Oh, gross. Like he just he gets really uh, uh, wigged out by that behavior because it's like, but you won't be here, right? Because you're going to actually go do your fucking job, correct? And then he just looks at him and Jonathan's like, yes, well, I'll see you later. And he leaves. And this is when we get like the funeral and later um, Van Helsing shows up and Van Helsing is played by Lawrence Olivier. And I guess he was known for hey, I make these really awesome movies in which I win like 40-some awards for, but sometimes I just need a paycheck, and so I just show up and coast. And this is a show up and coast movie. So he shows up. He's Abraham Van Helsing, who's supposed to be Dutch. I don't know what this accent is. I don't think it's Dutch, but it's okay. It doesn't matter. Lawrence Olivier. And he's sitting by Mina's grave because the baby has been killed, and we had our research scene Oh, yes. He's sitting in the study. You know it. You love it. There it was. A close up of like bat face. Yeah. He's like, bats. Bats have fangs. She is a bat, <laughs> logically speaking. Ugh. So he sitting by there. He's got garlic all over the grave. And Lucy shows up and Lucy's sitting with him and she's like, what's this on the grave? Which, of course, the English person doesn't know what the garlic is. The spice. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's that's terrible. That's not. I've never added this to food before. <laughs> what is this thing you speak of? It's not salt. So clearly, it's not. It should not be in food. And he's like, "Oh, that's the the flower of the garlic plant." And she's like, "Why are they all over the grave?" And he's like, "Do you believe in corporal transference?" And he's she's like, "No." And he's like, "How about manifestation?" And she's like, "No." And he's like, "Astral projection?" And she goes, "What the fuck?" <laughs> And well, just, according to quantum mechanics. He just leaves it at that. He's like, well, cool. Here's a cross. And so he gives her the cross. Oh, because he's implying, oh, he says, don't you know the myths of Central Europe? Werewolves, vampires. And she's like, vampire? What? Oh, we missed the dinner scene. Okay, I'm sorry. We have to whoop, whoop, whoop. Because Lucy is ends up being the only one who goes. Oh, right. And she shows up, turn out. This dress is beautiful. Her like glittery wrap with the fur Yeah, she's like her overcoat. Ugh. And then she just rolls in. First of all, he sends well, a coach. Yeah, so they're, her, she's walking with her father. Yeah. And her father's like. Oh, I guess I'll tell him we blah, can't Blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, I guess. We'll, um, 
you know, Mr. Van Helsing is coming tonight. Yeah. Uh, I guess we'll have to tell Count Dracula that we can't go to dinner tonight. Yeah. What? He invited us to dinner? Oh, yeah. I guess I forgot to tell you. Um, I'll just tell him we can't come. And she's like, no, I'll go. I'm going. She's like, I'll go for for the appearances. Like, it's just, it's, it's the polite na- thing to do, it's, father. It's good neighbors. I'm just being a good neighbor. That's the only reason I want to go alone to his house. And then he sends a coach, which we talk about uh, in Come In 81 Kilo, uh, the fact that Nick has no chill. Like, he just can't not do vampire things sometimes. Dracula also has no chill. So perhaps it's genetic because he sends this coach, which has... It's endemic to the condition. No driver. It is just... A driverless coach that shows up. She the gets reins in it. are attached to the horses. Yeah, and they go to the chair, but there's, there's nobody no one in the chair. There. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So she arrives, and normally, like the driver would hop down and open the door and put the put the stairs down for her, but he doesn't, which is why she sticks her head out like hello, and she ends up exiting herself, and she turns around to look at the driver to like the cheek of this man, not letting me out, but there's nobody there, and then it just drives off, and she's like, well. That's probably fine. <laughs> and so she goes. I'm a strong, independent woman. Then the door opens by itself. And she's like, uh, hello, Dracula. Because there's cobwebs everywhere. And we get the cool spider well, this, scene. This is the cleaned up, like, main room. Yeah. Where everything below 15 feet has been cleaned. It's like in the little toaster. Yeah. Brave little toaster. Yeah. Where the entire house below like the maximum height of Blanky, the walls are clean. Yeah. But above that, they're still dirty. Right. In this case, it's like I don't know, as far as Dracula could reach, like with the reaching up with a broom. (laughs) (laughs) Because he has no servants. Renfield's disappeared. Renfield actually is in the asylum at this point because he tried to accost uh, Jonathan Harker and tell him that yeah and get a ride out he's like count dracula is a vampire and you got to get me out of here and he's like god you're so weird punches him in the face he punches him in the face and puts him in the asylum all watched over by a very put upon looking fruit bat (laughs) 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 that poor fruit bat is like why am i here like this is the biggest bat we could find i know here's a flying fox just stick it on the tree it's fine and so he has no one. He must have done all right. of this himself. It's all by himself. Did he but cook dinner? the table, it's all cleaned and I everything. I like to imagine he ordered out, they delivered it, and he just replated it because he doesn't have a kitchen <laughs> or anything. And he must feed her. I don't know, because she comes over for dinner. And he ends up, like, appearing, which he always dramatically walks into the room. No matter what, he's never in the room. He's always dramatically entering it. So he enters it through this mouth portal thing that's behind the table. And he's like, ah, Miss Seward. Welcome. So there's just candles everywhere. And we cut to the scene where she's sitting on one end and there's all these candles in between them. So they get framed as like a face among all these, this light. And she's like, oh, I feel a million years old. Like I feel ancient tonight because I'm just so sad. And he's like, I get it. And he's like, I've, I'm, I too am weary and lonely. I've lost many people before. And he goes, I'm the last of my kind. We used to be. Like the brains and the sword and the shield for this great nation. And those days are long past. And now. Yeah, the days of war are gone. And now I'm just me. Which has to feel. I mean, you used to be literal royalty. The shit. shit. And you got to do whatever the fuck you wanted. And people admired you for it. And now you're weird and old and creepy. And all the stuff that everybody used to tell you was really like. You grew up knowing that that was like the best possible way you could act. Now that's now that's taboo and you're not supposed to do it anymore. Um, as an allegory for living past your time, Dracula is pretty good. I mean, he's in a world that doesn't make sense to him anymore. He's trying to make it make sense. But at the same time, he likes hot chicks and he can't stay away from them. So it's really challenging. And. He's cool. just looking for human connection. He's just looking for connection. And that's what he's talking to her about. And she goes, you know what? But we shouldn't look to the past. And he goes, you're right. And I heard you speak some Romanian. And she starts to say something. And then he responds in Romanian. And she laughs. And he goes, see, I told you you understood. And she's like, no, no, really. I didn't know what you said. And he goes, I said it would be nice to see you smile. 
I mean, come on. What woman isn't going to be like, that's it. Yep, that's fine. You want to get married? We go right now. It's Because he's like, and then he has this line, which I was like, Matt, we need to stop a minute and unpack this. Because he says, he says, if at any time my company does not please you, you will have only yourself to blame for an acquaintance who seldom forces himself, but is difficult to be rid of. And I think what we came down on was, he is really attracted to her, and if she ever gets annoyed with his presence, it's her fault for being so like alluring and attractive. And he's right, not, not gonna necessarily like <clears throat> she's at fault because of actions she has taken. Yeah, but I... he's he's so attracted to her because of her attributes. Yeah, and so he's. And he's so attracted to her that he can't keep himself away from her. Yeah. And that is caused by her attributes. Yeah. So it is like her, like her being her fault. Quote fault. Yeah. Rather than like her actions consequences. Yeah. Like it's your fault for dressing skimpy. It's more like I have fallen for you and I'm not going to push this issue, but I'm not going away either. Right. So I'm going to be around. And I'm going to try to, like, make my presence pleasing to you. But maybe you won't find me pleasing. And in that situation, I'll still be around. Yeah. Like, sorry, I just, I really like you. Kind of. And she's like, oh, okay. And then we cut to them walking in this vine-covered walkway area. He takes her uh, to the atrium. Yeah, they're, they're in the uh, conservatory where all the vines <laughs> are growing. And he hears a wolf and he says, oh, the children of the night. This is another. Oh, this is a Dracula line. The children of the night. And usually it's what sweet music they make. But he goes, what sad music they make. And she goes, sad? I think it sounds nice. And he goes, no, I think it sounds like lonely. I think it sounds lonely. And she says, oh, but I really like the night. It's so simple. And he goes, yeah, so deceptive. <laughs> and then she says, no, it's it's made for enjoyment. And he says, yes, but you take for granted the dawn and the sunlight. But you can't take the night for granted. And he's she's like, oh, you get me. <laughs> and so we get a bit he of says, a make He says the night is for like enjoying life. Yeah. Or savoring life. Yeah. And so he kisses her. And then he stops and he's like, I'm sorry. I'm I'm forcing my way into your life and I apologize. And she's like, Nope, I want this. I didn't say no. Yeah. She goes, I am here of my own volition. Thank you, 1979's Dracula, for giving this moment of I consent. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I I am here for this. He does make her look at him, but we don't get the impression that he is uh, forcing himself on her right. He's in not a hypnotic way. Right. Yeah. He's just using his natural riz. Yeah. Because he doesn't, he's looking all around her face, which may be Frank Langella's attempt at like, you can't see my eyes moving too much if I'm flicking around, looking at different stuff. But it's also like, I want to take all of you in. And so they make out, mm -hmm. and then he does this, like, lower to the throat, and then he stops, and he ends up biting her earlobe, and then kissing her ear, which must sound like, like, <laughs> just like, <laughs> it would tickle so bad. And then he steps back, and he's like, y you need to go. Like, I, you gotta go. And she goes, uh, no, I don't. <laughs> it's fine. So he's like, we'll see each other again. Yeah, she go he says, it'll be light soon. She's like, not for hours. And he goes, I I'll see you again. And she goes, I certainly hope so. And then we cut to her and Van Helsing in the graveyard and the graves all covered in in garlic. And he mentions vampire. And I think Lucy immediately puts it together. Personally, I, I choose to interpret this moment because she gets up and she's like, vampire, what? No. And then he's like, here, have this cross. It was going to be Mina's. I didn't give it to her soon enough. She would want you to have it. Here you have it. And he puts it on her. And then as we're, we're like seeing a mist shrouded figure run to the graveyard. Yes, we're seeing a silhouette in the fog. Yeah. Because he's using his vampire powers. Uh, yes, obviously, to ride this horse, <laughs> which Matt was like, now nah, you know what? He doesn't have any stables. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you Do you want to explain where you think? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this was mostly a joke. Uh, so there's, a joke. there's a movie 
an anime movie called Pompoko. Yes. Uh, which contains a depiction of a Japanese mythology mythological figure um, of these raccoons. There's like a, a kind of sentient raccoon that has shape-shifting abilities. What do they shape-shift, Matthew? They shape-shift their scrotum. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I said, Carfax Abbey doesn't have a stables, like a maintained stables that we can see. Uh, he doesn't have any staff to take care of horses. Where did his horse come from? Maybe he can partially shapeshift his body. Maybe <laughs> he can partially riding... shapeshift a very specific part of his body. So maybe <laughs> the horse is him. Wink, wink. 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 Yeah. <laughs> and that's why the horse reacts so violently to the presence of the garlic. <laughs> because the horse... Is him, and <laughs> it's it doesn't like the garlic. I had to pause the movie for Matt to extrapolate all that out for me. He was like, "Like, follow me." I think that's I think that's him. That's God. Don't ruin that smart mate. But he ends up walking up to them on the horse, and in the colorized version, this is very clearly daytime, very clearly. In the muted version, it's more like misty evening, and. He's talking to them, and he looks over at Lucy, and he says, what's that on your neck? What is that thing around your neck? And she goes, oh, it's a gift from Mr. Very, Van Helsing. Very accusatory. Yeah. Oh, it's a gift from Mr. Van Helsing. And he pauses, and he goes, how nice. <laughs> like, hmm. Let's see what's up here. And he says, I'm going to go pay my respects to Mina with your permission to Van Helsing and Van Helsing's like with my blessing and so he ends up going in to pay his respects I think he's like I think there's shenanigans afoot maybe I need to check on Mina but her grave is undisturbed except for the garlic except for the garlic and I don't know and the cross this is always the hole for me is he just is like well that's sink or swim he's like I'm gonna I tried to help you you ended up being too frail you died and now you're creepy and gross, and I kind of don't want to have anything to do with you. But I'm going to confirm you exist, and then I'm not even going to mention it. And then he just leaves. But Van Helsing sees this horse rearing up at Mina's grave, and he's like, huh, I have an idea. Because that night he goes and lets a horse loose, and somehow horses are vampire detectors. The horse is like, vampire, here! And he's like stomping on the grave. Whatever. This part, uh, uh, Frank Langell well, not I got, I, I got the impression that this was Van Helsing's horse. Yeah. And, like, he has knowledge of vampires from... The books he read. From living in Europe. Maybe. And from being Dutch. <laughs> from being Dutch. <laughs> okay. And he brought his vampire hunting horse with him. Yeah. What this really is, is a way to get Lucy alone. Because they come... So what happens is... Lucy... Uh, sees them down there doing whatever shenanigans. And she's like, well, all right. Because she's standing and looking in the mirror. And she actually takes the cross off and hangs the cross on the little... The picture frame picture with, her, frame and with her and Mina. And to me, this moment represents Lucy's choice. I choose Dracula. Because she takes the cross off. Because he mentioned vampires. She's not dumb. She may know the vampire myth. And she's like, okay, I've put two and two together. I know what Dracula is, but I'm still into this. So she takes the cross off, and then she just goes and sits at the bottom of the bed like she's waiting. Right. As Rachel said while we were watching the movie, Dracula is literally the only man that she interacts with in this movie that is not trying to take away her agency. Yeah. He's trying to gift her with uh, infinite amount of agency except he scuttles it with one little line because he does the like the door the window flies open and he walks in first he's got like his cape wrapped around his shoulders and then he flicks open the cape and it's like oh oopsies i appear to have forgotten to fasten my shirt buttons because he's got this open chest which okay i'm not mad at this scene even a little bit and so he walks in and he's like my dearest beloved, I will make you flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood, 
And you're like, oh, yeah. And she's even like, I'm into this. Okay. Yep. Fo- following. And he's like, you will cross land and sea to do my bidding. And then there's a little eh. bit of like, mm, eh, that's, ah, that's fine. It's still better than the previous offer. No problem. At least they'll be able maybe, to. Maybe it's not a command. Like he's not making an assertion. He's making a claim that she they will be in love with each other so much that she would be willing to do things for him. All he had to add was and I will do to, yours. Yeah. And yeah. Like if he made Donzo. it reciprocal then yeah. it would it would convey a lot. Better. Yeah, it's the seventies. They were doing their best. At least we got at least and we got, we got the first this cup. much. We got this much. So it's yeah. fine. And so she's like sold. So she stands up and he undoes her little dressing gown. So she just has shoulders. And then he does this, like, picks her up and carries her to the bed, which is like, (laughs) I love this scene. And he, like, lays her on the bed. And, of course, they're, they're like, you know, in bed. And then he says, "Uh, I need your blood. And then he just goes, I need. And then he just stops at that. And then we get the, like, I kiss all the way up from your sternum to your neck. And then he bites her. And we go into this. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> honestly the most dated part of the movie everything else i feel like could be made today i feel like this movie could be made today which in the 1979 um critique that i read they were like it's too fast it just pushes you through this movie too fast and i'm like thank god because some 70s movies are like i could fall asleep wake up and i wouldn't miss any plot it's fine yeah. um this is probably the most dated scene because it's this um, like red backlit. This red backlit scene, which really is of their silhouettes. It's super impactful in the muted version because it's the brightest color that we get mm-hmm. in the movie. And it's their silhouettes of them making out. And then a bat shows up, which I don't know. Maybe the bat's metaphorical. I don't really know. Matt said it's his shadow self. It's like he is himself in this moment. He's incorporating all of his aspects in this his, sex scene. <laughs> His, uh, I don't know, his mind, whatever, yeah. his personality is fully present. Yeah. I don't know. It's better than the 70s fumbling sex scene if we'd had a weird. Right. With like gratuitous nudity. And uh, yeah. Whatever. It would have been, uh, you know, I don't know. I wouldn't have liked it as much. This is much more like, ooh, he's literally transporting her. Like this is so, this is such absorbing sex. She feels like she's it's in an another other reality. It's an otherworldly It's otherworldly. Okay, yeah. great. And um, you can't top that, so Dunzo. Like, what human man's ever going to give that to her after this? Mm, no one. No one. And so she comes back from that, and they come back in the house, and they go to find her, and she's, like, sprawled on the bed. <laughs> Honestly, it looks like she just had a really great night. <laughs> she's just like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so Jack's like, no, I've never seen John. you this way. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Normally John bad. shows up at the house. Like he's rushed his way back from going yeah. to deliver the deed to the official whatever. Yeah. And so he's rushing back. It's really late at night. Yeah. And he goes to Lucy's house and the lady's like, um, or he asks about Lucy. And she goes, and he's yeah, like, she's in bed. She's like, she's in bed. Like most sane people right now. Yeah. And he's and like, he's oh, like okay. oh, gotcha. I'll like, go do you're, that. You're not going to go wake her up. Um, l- let me just sneak in and I'll, I'll go to sleep and I'll see her in the morning. Yeah. Uh, but he goes straight to her room. Yeah. And he knocks on the door and she's in there like, oh yeah. She's just basking. That's what it looks like. Yeah. I'm mm. Afterglow. And he's like, wow, I've never seen her look like that before. She must be sick. <laughs> Normally she just... <laughs> 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 and so he calls for everybody. <laughs> Hold on. There's a meme that is occasionally accompanied with like a video clip of this guy getting interviewed and like this theme gets reused fairly regularly. But the guy is saying, yeah, I don't think the female orgasm is real because like I've had sex with a lot of women and I've never seen a woman orgasm. (laughs) And so the meme response is that's your, that's like the biggest self own like ever. (laughs) Um, Yeah, you need to stop telling on yourself (laughs) about that kind of thing. (laughs) But that's what I thought of when John walks into the room and he's like, oh, no. (laughs) She must be sick. What is that? I've never seen any woman like this. (laughs) 
But of course, it's because she's lost a great deal of blood, which they walk in, they touch her, and they're like, she's lost a great deal of blood. I hate that so much. <laughs> the, the, oh no, you can tell by looking at her that she's down a quart or two. Okay, whatever. Right. And so they give her a, they give her a transfusion to help her out. And of course, Jonathan Harker has the same blood type as her, so he's giving her a transfusion. And in the meantime, Van Helsing is stalking around like, oh, I'm rubbing garlic on the windows. And we didn't even mention the fact that Sylvester McCoy is in this. He's the seventh doctor. He's in this. His name is Walter. I guess mm-hmm. he had quite a large part. They actually requested that he be in this. And by the end of editing, he's reduced down to like a background character. I don't even think he, he may have like two lines. Sylvester McCoy has gone on to be in a lot of stuff. He's in Sense Eight. He's the Doctor. He's he's been in just he was Doctor Rad- Who. He, the yeah, doctor. he was in he was Radagast in Hobbit, the Hobbit movies. The new ones. The new ones. Okay. Yeah. Well, anyway, I still haven't seen those. Um, we saw the first one. We saw the first one. Yeah, that's, that's the whole thing. Uh, we'll anyway. get to that. Um, so anyway, he's in this, but. I just want he's the one who's rubbing the garlic on the windows. That's why I thought about it. And they're like, can you please not put garlic in here? Like, I'm already nauseous. This is really like, don't don't do that. And he's like, there is a reason for everything that I'm doing. And then he goes down to this room that has a giant mirror. And he's having a drink. And Dracula walks in, which this is a cool scene because we see the doors opening in the mirror and they're empty. And then. And I think this room is actually it's like a double size room. And we're looking through just an open hole in the wall that's framed like a window. Yeah. But then we also have an equivalent wall where there's actually a mirror there. Yeah. And so they're angling the the camera work in this movie is so good. Yeah. But that that's how I think they achieved this. Yeah. Where the, it's actually two rooms and they open the doors at the same time. But anytime we're seeing the quote mirror where dracula is not showing up on the other side it's the camera angle is such that we we can see van helsing in the frame but his reflection where it would be in the mirror is out of the frame right and so we get the effect that we have one camera angle that's looking this way we can see van helsing's reflection but then we get the camera angle from slightly behind van helsing and we don't see, we can't see Van Helsing's reflection and we don't see Dracula's reflection. And so it's practical effects. Yeah. Age so much better. They so, they than so. Any do. kind of, um, yeah. You know, altering of the film. Yeah. yeah. So he's walking in and Van Helsing goes, Oh, what the devil? And Dracula goes, I'm not so bad as all that. Oh, you scared me. I didn't hear you come in. Yeah, and he goes, That's weird because this, this, mirror reflects the entire room and i didn't see you walking in and you see i'll have to go to the manufacturer and uh try to <laughs> well you see, see dracula like ho, 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 and then he grabs like a vase and he chucks it at the mirror and breaks and the breaks mirror it, and van helsing's like the fuck man and dracula's like yeah mirrors are symbols of man's vanity and i just don't like them and i break, blah, blah, blah. I break them every time i see them <laughs> and this is the part where <laughs> it's my favorite exchange because Abraham Van Helsing says, you are a strange creature. And Dracula goes, yes. <laughs> it's like growing up, people would say, Matt, you're so weird. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, he just goes, yes. I'll take that as a compliment. And then he goes, I'm seeing to Miss Lucy's treatment and I prescribed her something very special. Would you like to see? And Dracula's like, yeah, anything and- you prescribe for Lucy is of great interest to me. And so he walks over and he like holds up the garlic ball. And Dracula's like, <laughs> Just, and then he goes, you are a very wise man, Mr. Van Helsing. And then he does this like head whip because at first he's got his eyes closed like, okay, 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 recalculating, recalculating. And then he like turns and he's like, for a man who's only lived one lifetime. Or not even one lifetime. Not even one lifetime. <laughs> and Van Helsing gets a couple of lines. But the, then uh, Dracula says... I have lived in my 500 years. Anyone who has crossed me has died, and some not pleasantly, implying that some died pleasantly. (laughs) Well, some may have just died of old age, Mm. and so he just out-survived them. Yeah, implying that maybe that's the pleasant version, I guess, because he's like, listen, eventually you're all going to be dust, 
and I'm going to still be here. So you can be mad at me all you want, but sorry, bitch, I'm going to outlive you. Time is on my side. Right, which he kind of uh, reiterates later where when he's talking to John, I think, and he says, I'll just leave. And after after you are gone, yeah. I'll come back and call Lucy from her grave and spend eternity with her. Yeah, she's already mine because they exchanged blood. Not only did he drink her blood, but she drank his. Right. And the transformation only happens when she dies. Yeah, so uh, we're good to go. I've already got her. Because he goes, you'll never get Lucy. And he's like, oh, I already have. I guess she's already mine. But we can't skip this part. This is the epic showdown between Dracula, the first epic showdown between Dracula and Van Helsing. And so he, he's trying to hypnotize Van Helsing, and it doesn't quite work. He does get him to drop the garlic, but he's like, oh, you have a strong mind. He's like, yes. He goes, then I shall come to you. And so he starts stalking towards Van Helsing, and Van Helsing pulls out this cross thing, and he holds it up. And so Dracula backs up, and then he's like, weaponized ficus. <laughs> And he, well, he says he's a sacrilege. No, no. He gently pushes the ficus at Van Helsing. There's yeah. a potted plant right there, and he's like, "Potted plant, go!" And he like pushes it. <laughs> forward. And Van Helsing's just like, "What? <laughs> Did it work?" And then he so he starts yelling sacrilege, and then he jumps out the window, and we get the cool like window transition to wolf split screen. Yes, cool, absolutely. That was cool. extremely Love it. well done. And then he runs off, and they're like, "Ha ha, we have Dracula!" And so Dracula leaves, and they've got Lucy, and Lucy currently unconscious, and so they decide that they need to. At at this point, we found Mina. Mina was wandering around in the mines, and. Um, Van Helsing staked her, which is honestly the most acting that Lawrence Olivier does in this entire movie is when he's sobbing because he had to be the one to kill his own daughter. And then they decide that the best possible course of action to do next is dig her up and remove her heart. Because staking her wasn't enough. We have to make sure her heart is separated from but her yeah, body. They, well, they, they dig her up and then they find the casket empty. Yeah. And they go down into the cave. Yeah, they stake, stake her. her. And then after that, they dig her back up because we oh, see I thought, Walter. I thought this was before they buried her again. No, yeah. Well, maybe it's before. Because I don't think they reburied her okay. well, after they, he staked They her. have to remove her heart. Yes. That's the whole point. Yeah. So they come out and she's kind of there in a shroud and they pull it and they're removing her heart. And Lucy is watching this all like, oh, shit, they're going to do this to me. They're going to take this choice away from me. They're going to literally remove my heart take out a piece of literally me. and metaphorically yeah so that i cannot have what i want and what i want is dracula so she's like hmm, maybe i could have some tea i'm feeling cold and her nursemaid is like yeah sure of course you're supposed to be you're in supposed bed. to be in bed anyway but oh, like you ever listen to anybody like i could keep you there right and then she's like yeet and she runs off and gets <laughs> her little her little um single horse carriage thing and she runs Chariot. off it I, I was not going to say chariot. I was trying to think of another word for it. And so Mini she's carriage. leaving. But unfortunately, Jonathan's car is faster than this horse. And this poor horse actually hits the car. Like the car pulls in front of yeah, it and the horse. You can see the horse bounce off of the car. Poor horse. This is definitely before the uh, no animals were harmed in the making of this movie. Yes. Yeah. Oh, poor horse. And so she's like, she actually gets the riding crop and she smacks Van Helsing with it. And she's like, get the fuck out of my way. She's like, he is the nicest, kindest man I have ever met. And they're like, you, you're being hysterical. Uh, have you have you tried laudanum in the seaside? Like, you're clearly not. You're clearly not thinking this through. Have you tried isolation and doing drugs about it? Yeah. And she's like, no, no, you guys all suck. I'm going to Dracula. And so she tries to get around them. And they end up, like, pushing her on her back. And I was like, little known it's, fact. It's you, like a shark. It's like little known fact. If you flip a woman on her back, she spontaneously passes out because <laughs> she's like, oh, oh, and then she passes out. I wonder if there was supposed to be like an injection. No, nah, I think it's supposed to be. She's not in her right mind or she's in this space between life and death. So she's once she's subdued, she just goes back to being unconscious because then they put her in the asylum. And this is a this is which a uh, does get I guess later we get. A reinforcement of that idea after Dracula breaks her out, we get a s sequence of scenes of them traveling together towards Carfax Abbey. Yeah, and she's unconscious. They, they keep alternating between her being unconscious and being carried and her like walking alongside Dracula. Right. 
But before we get there, we're at the asylum, and this is when uh, Van Helsing is like, wow, you put her in the asylum? And uh, Jack is like, yeah, I did. She was a danger. She was, like, wild when she woke up. And he's like, oh, did you give her laudanum? And he goes, not my daughter. But he gave laudanum to Van Helsing's daughter. Yeah, he was giving plenty of laudanum to Mina, but not to Mm -hmm. Lucy. And so... Uh, and John is like, it can't be as bad as that. <clears throat> yeah, so Jonathan walks in to go see her. And she's like, oh, hey, Jonathan. What's up? Do you still it's love so me? It's so good to see you. And he's like, yeah, I still love you. I worship you. And she's like, that's great. Can you answer me a question? Like, what were you doing with Mina's body in the in the cemetery? And he's like, oh, yeah, um, I'm not, I can't. Oof. And she's like, no, it's okay. You can tell me. Um, what were you guys all doing at, at Carfax? It, if you love me, then... Show me you trust me. Maybe, maybe we can, like, we can, it's okay, we can get together. It's fine. And so, we're, we're locked in a room alone. And actually, prior to this, don't they go to Carfax? They run to Carfax to go, after they subdue Lucy, they go to Carfax to, like, confront Dracula. And so they end up going down into the crypt area. Oh, yes. And there's all these open graves. The shovel fighting scene. Did he dig these up? Did Renfield There are a lot of up? old... Human bones. There are a lot of old human bones laying around in this, like, crypt. Yeah. In a very, like, haphazard way. <clears throat> it feels like maybe Renfield was a um, a resurrection man. A resurrection man? They would dig up bodies and sell them to doctors. Oh. For anatomy. Especially at an abbey. Yeah. I could, Yeah. I could see that. Yeah, and maybe these were ones that were too far gone. They didn't get bought. Or he was waiting for them to skeletonize so that he could take the skeleton and sell the skeleton. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter. It's for ambiance. And so they walk through and they're like, oh, the smell. And then It's it's fitting for Dracula, but given that he's been here for like three days, Yeah. How how did he get like (laughs) ten year old bones? It's the same reason that this This (laughs) This, <laughs> this abbey, this is. <laughs> abbey is thematically appropriate for him. We just don't question it. Just don't question it. So he ends up getting. They go down, and he's. It's in, the psychedelic death monks again. Yes, and so they open the the one crate that's like displayed in the middle of this room, and they're like, "Oh snap, he's not in there. Where could he be?" And then he just whoop, appears down the hallway, and he's like, "Welcome to my home, gentlemen. <laughs> like you surprised me." And they're like, "Oh, we're surprised to see you up and around during daylight hours." And yeah, I love ben this Helsing line. Ben is like, "I underestimated your powers to move around in the daytime." Right, and I love this line. He goes, "It's always day somewhere on Earth." After my rest, I just need to stay in the dark. Yeah, I just need to stay in the dark. And so this is the cool part where they try to hit him with the shovel, and he immediately turns into a bat. Yeah, and then he beats up Jonathan Harker as a bat because he's like. <laughs> <laughs> Tackles him. He like tackles this, him to the ground. This is like in D and D. Um in our current game, my character is a druid, and so I could you know transform into like tiny stuff, but then like I can try to grapple. Yeah. Like a full size person. Well you are a you're a fairy. Yes. Yes. I'm a fairy. And I could you're a technically foot tall. Yeah. grapple a six foot yeah, human. He gets he he gets grappled by a bat, is exactly what yes. happens. <laughs> and so they end up like opening the window and he Lights on fire and the poor little like bat sound of pain as he's like, ow, and he flies off. Like, you guys are so mean. (laughs) (laughs) That's not fair. That's not fair. And so then they're like, he's going to come for Lucy tonight. So we have to stay on guard. Um, They're not even a minor threat because he he climbs up the wall of the the asylum. He breaks in the window where Renfield is. He's like, Renfield, yeah, we get another cool climbing scene. Yeah, and he's like, wall climbing. Renfield, I'm not angry at you i'm well, disappointed i think it's interesting that the portrayal of the asylum is such that we have renfield like they're so dismissive of the patient's concerns claims needs yeah. whatever renfield is like banging on the door he's like dracula's coming for me he's about to break through that window he's gonna come in here and kill me please help me and they're like, ah, shut up. And they just close the little window. viewing window again. Yeah. And then Dracula breaks in the window. And like the banging, he would have had to, well, I guess he can turn into stuff. He could get through the bars. Yeah. But he, he breaks just the needs glass. To get the, the window out. They probably would have heard the breaking glass. They do. 
Jonathan oh. stops and he's like, is that breaking glass? And he's like, well, crazy people. And then he just goes back to what he's doing. But they shouldn't be able to break the glass with the bars over the windows. They shouldn't have anything. If they have something in there that's capable of breaking the glass, that's a safety concern. We should matter. have removed oh, that. Oh, safety concern. That's like that's not a concern. Uh, well, they don't want the people to get harmed. They don't care if the people get harmed. Well, they just want them contained. The one guy's chained most, to the bed. Most of these people that are in here, are, it's like a revenue stream. Yeah. It's like you don't want to disrupt your revenue stream by having your yeah, – ostensibly somebody is paying for these people to be in here. If somebody dies, the asylum loses money. Yeah. Like we always say, follow the money. Follow the money. You can trust a company to matter. protect its – Revenue streams. It doesn't matter because what immediately happens is Dracula's like, I'm really disappointed in you, Renfield. And he breaks his neck. And he breaks his neck and he's like, well, that's done. And so he breaks open the door, which is really just a distraction because they all run up immediately to get to the door. And in the meantime, he smokes slithers underneath Lucy's door. And then he breaks the wall out like, whoa, like everybody feels the impact of him like exploding the sidewall of this. Uh, asylum and then he dips with Lucy and they they like go out the the hole and he's holding Lucy and they're crawling down the wall together yep which is a really cool scene and then we get him like carrying her through the woods like desperately trying to flee with her because he's trying to save her from these men who are also trying to save her but we don't believe that they have her we believe they're, they're trying to save their idea of her. Correct. Thank you. That's the way. But I they to put have it. not actually paid attention and listened to her desires. What she actually wants. I mean, I can see, like, honey, I don't want you to become a man-eating monster. But at the same time, as a metaphor for she wants to become an independent woman, that's what we're going for. Is like Dracula's in this for her. To be able to be her, and they're in this for her to be subdued and feminine and kind and gentle and sweet again, which she never really was in the first place. That's just the perception that they had of her. That was just her masking. And I think from the point that we arrive back at Carfax Abbey, and he says, no, I need you to be a creature of the daylight for a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. And then once I get home, you get to be like me, and they'll become our prey. And we'll be able to do what we want with them, like, indefinitely. And she's, like, sold. I think from that point on, all of this is something that he is orchestrating. Oh, yes. This is all going to plan. <clears throat> it's all, Yeah. Because he's a smart man. He has a bunch of crates of dirt. It would not be that hard to send out a decoy crate of dirt and distract these people. He could send five crates of dirt in five different directions. He doesn't. He only gets in one. He passes in front of right where they are they don't tie down the back of the wagon so it's immediately obvious he lures them to the seaside and ultimately he almost kills them because they get in that car accident and then they apparently walk 10 miles all the way to the whatever and then they're like oh no he's on that ship well i guess the the carriage with the box got to the ship and they successfully loaded the box onto the ship by the time John and, yeah, and the ship ben had Helsing departed. arrived. And the, yeah, the ship is like getting ready to go, but yeah. it hasn't like left port yet. So they chase down the ship and it's just Van Helsing and Jonathan at this point. They leave Jack on the shore. Yeah. And so they get off and of course these guys are Russian. They don't know what they're saying. So they end up running down in the cargo hold and at first they don't see them and then they find the box and they open the box and they're just snuggling, which is really cute. Mm -hmm. And she wakes up first and she's got like eyes and fangs, which she had in the asylum too. And it's very much like, uh-uh, this is what I've chosen. You don't get to, to you don't get to make decisions for me anymore. Right. Uh, I'm I'm a monster. I'm an empowered woman now. And so she gets to have this cool moment where she fights with them. And Jonathan fucking backhands her. He like, whoosh, like slaps her down. What? You don't come back from that. I don't care. If I was a vampire, you're still not allowed to backhand me. Okay? Just so we get that cleared out. Okay. Thank you. Um, but 
it's really funny because she ultimately wakes up Dracula right before Van Helsing stakes him. And so he just grabs the stake and stakes Van Helsing with it. Yeah. And just I mean, nonchalantly pushes Van Helsing and Van Helsing goes like flying backwards. Yeah. See what I, he had, he was perfectly capable of defending himself this entire time. But I feel like he leads them on this merry chase because the best way to get them well, I think to stop. He, he had hoped, like, the best outcome in, of this plan of action is they just get they away. actually get away on the boat. Yeah. But in the event that they get stopped, he's like, eh, like, the worst case scenario here is I got to eat. Yeah. And, and Lucy hangs around with them for a little while longer. Yeah. Which I think is why he leaves her human, because he says, you know, I'm the king of my kind. I'm different. There's nobody like me. And he's, we've seen him out in the daylight. He ends up, of course, they end up defeating him because we have to defeat Dracula. In the end, that's the whole point. But um, Van Helsing, while he's dying, like pushes this hook and it hooks him right between the shoulder blades where he can't unhook himself. Right. It's like the hoist. Yeah. The uh, cargo the, hoist. Yeah. And so they end up hoisting him out. And... I guess they killed Van Helsing here because they were hoping to make a sequel and Laurence Olivier wasn't going to be able to come back again. So they killed his uh, character off. Okay. And actually at the end, he's replaced by a different actor. <laughs> Once he's staked to the wall, he's a different actor. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't pick that up. Uh, it's not that obvious, but in the trivia, everyone's like, oh yeah, I could tell. And I'm like, I couldn't. It's kind of dark. I don't know. I didn't really care. I didn't care about Van Helsing. I cared about Dracula. So I was right. like, oh good, he's dead. And then Jonathan Harker... Um, winches him up and he's like no which honestly the weakest part of this whole movie is his growling at the end here where he's like meow, 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 right, it's meow, like meow, 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 meow. cat sounds <laughs> what's happening we could have just left it him screaming and it would have been fine but he dies quote unquote dies in the sunlight and Lucy turns back into a regular girl and she has this like look of devastation like oh great the only thing I have left now is Jonathan fucking Harker just fucking great and then she sees his cape fly off in the wind and she gets this look like, oh, yeah. Yeah, we see we see the the same silhouette <laughs> that we saw coming down the stairs yeah. in Carfax Abbey. Um, we see that same like rigid cape yeah. shaped like a bat wing kind of fly thing. Off. Um, gliding off yeah. into the sunset. Or as the 1979 critic said, her eyes speak of sequels yet to come. Ooh, that's that's nice. Yeah. But, of course, this movie was released in a year when there were eight different vampire movies all released at the same time. And it actually concurs with another one called Love at First Bite, which is a comedic, like a comedic take on Dracula. It would be like scary movie being out in theaters at the same time as Scream. Yeah. One undermines the other. Because this is a super serious vampire movie, you guys. And it takes itself so seriously. And... The rest of the ones that come out are not. They're all like disco vampires, sex vampires, funny vampires. And this one is the serious adaptation of a very well-loved Dracula play. It's yep. It would be like a bunch of Marvel movies came out and you had that one super serious DC movie, which would have been fine if it was on its own. But because it's with all of these mildly comedic Marvel movies, it ends up feeling comedically serious. Over the top yeah. serious. And that's what this one was. So it didn't do, it did fine, but it didn't do great. It didn't do well enough to justify a sequel to right. the studio. I really liked it. Me I too. liked it a lot. I would watch it again. I thought this was a wonderful adaptation of Dracula. If you had to ad adapt Dracula at all, I liked this. I liked the I am. Literally the epitome of sex appeal, Dracula. Right. I'm a person too. I have, I just have different needs than you. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not just a violent monster. Right. Yeah. I don't, I never like the one note Dracula, which is, I mean, Nosferatu gets a lot of love. The original Nosferatu that we did. And I think we asked the question in that episode, is it the greatest vampire movie of all time? Because that's often what it's called. And to me, no, because he feels very... I am a monster. I don't really have enough agency to make re rational choices. I literally am just driven by my instincts. And that's never my favorite right. and adaptation. And the, the scariest part of the monster is that he looks humanoid. Yeah. Whereas to me, this is far more terrifying. 
because it is a a wolf in sheep's clothing, but the wolf is hot and you're kind of not mad. You're kind of not mad. <laughs> yeah. The men all around you, him are mad. You kind of root for Dracula in this movie. You do. You don't kind of, you do. Uh, you want him to win. By the end of it, I just want him to defeat these three frat bros that are keeping him from being able to be with the woman he loves. And who loves him back. And somehow you forgive him for killing Mina and for killing Renfield. You're like, yeah, Renfield had it coming. Oh, Mina was so sad and sick. He was just trying to help her out. You're like, I, I want to give this man every benefit of and the doubt. And I think, okay, here's, here's maybe um, an interpretation that helps with the Mina situation. He gets there and he's like, oh, here's here's two young unmarried women. Yeah. They're both kind of digging on me. Lucy's engaged. Mina. Hmm. Mina's available. I don't think it was a sexual attraction with Mina. I think it was she saved my life. I perceive her as weak and sickly. I have the option of making her of possibly making her better. I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to save right. her so life. So he too. tries. Yeah. And but then she dies right away. Yeah. Like the stress of like his transformation um, is too much, is too for, much her. for her body in her sickly state. So then he's kind of like, okay, I need to go check up on Mina. But then he like falls in love with Lucy. Right. And he's he... kind of like, oh. Because we're not. I'll spend my to... energy on Lucy rather than following yeah, up with that Mina. Mina thing. I gave it a shot. It's not working. We're not supposed to ascribe human morality to him anyway. Right. So the fact that he is immediately dismissive, like, "Well, I tried for Mina. It didn't work. At least she had a pleasant death. Okay, whatever." And then he just doesn't worry about it because it's mm -hmm. not in the scope of things that he is concerned about. Right. He's like, okay, on to Lucy. I kind of dug Lucy more anyway. I'm ready. I want Lucy to be with me, like, forever. I just wanted to save Mina. I wasn't interested in having her around forever. I just wanted to give her the app. Maybe he sees what he made her as a benefit. Yeah. Like, perhaps if she was around long enough, she would have gained the kind of agency that he has. I don't know. It... It's left ambiguous, and it's fine that's a, that it's ambiguous because he's supposed to be morally gray. He's supposed to be villainous. Yes, we root for him, but we root for him in the, like, I know rooting for you is kind of the wrong thing. <laughs> We're supposed to feel that way, and that's fine. This movie really achieves that. Yeah. Um, It gives you feelings about all of the characters, which is what you should have. It shouldn't be like, oh, that's a really bad, bad guy. They're very one note. They're being bad for the sake of being bad, 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 whatever, whatever, whatever. It's like, okay, he's lonely. He's not human. The only way that he can bring anybody over to be with him and make him less lonely is by making them like him, which is an inherently dangerous process. So he's either stuck with being lonely forever or he... He makes an omelet he's by gotta, breaking a couple of eggs. He's going to make the same omelet. <laughs> okay, you know, whatever. And I think that really playing into his wolf in sheep's clothing aspect, the I am a seductive monster, but I am not a monstrous monster, is right. exactly the tone I want from Dracula. And that's what I got from this movie and for me, it makes it infinitely rewatchable because I feel like I have already gotten more from the dialogue rewatching it several times than I did just the first time watching it through. Because it's like anything in the 70s, I'll, we achieve a lot with verbal interplay. Like Murder by Death is one of my favorite movies. It's hysterical. It's a little bit of physical comedy, a lot of dialogue comedy. So they are expecting you to give your full attention to the movie and to listen to every word that comes out of people's mouths and to think about it. And I really enjoy that. Yeah. We all know I'm a dialogue. Like I love dialogue. I, I lo that is probably bad dialogue will ruin something for me more than bad special effects. Right. I'll put we, up. We both like character driven stories. Yeah. We like a good, we like a good character interaction. And I think we get that in this movie. 
it, are the action sequences, like the fight sequences, the best fight sequences in the world? No. I mean, somebody throws a ficus at somebody. Like, go, go, plant, go. But that's okay. It's fine. You know, it's not the point of the movie, so whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with all that. Okay. I guess we'll just leave it here. I hope everybody enjoyed that movie as much as we did. And we're going to be doing lots more 1979 vampires, Ooh. including the remake of Nosferatu, which is up next. So remember, sometimes the strangest things are the most beautiful, too. So be who you are and love what you love, even if that means you love Dracula. Until next time, friends. Bye. Bye.